Hello, I'm Steve Doggett, the Director of Development for Mercy Inc. And welcome to our webinar today. We're the, glad that you're here. Today, we're gonna to be outlining a life-changing and a life-affirming literacy ministry. It's one of the most meaningful works that we do. And we're glad that you can join us for the next 45 minutes. Thank you. You know, there are seven benefits to literacy and I'll run through them really quickly. Literacy, literacy improves health. It promotes lifelong learning and builds skills. It improves the economy and creates jobs. It promotes gender equality. It promotes democracy and peace. It builds self-esteem and overall quality of life. And finally, literacy opens the door to reading God's love letter to us, the Holy Bible. What a wonderful gift is the gift of literacy. Uh, by the way, please do use the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen to ask any questions that you might have, and we'll try to respond to them uh, at the end of this webinar today. Uh, Mercy Inc. is all about transformation through acts of compassion and bringing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We endeavor to see individuals and communities transform. Many people today live under the burden of poverty and disaster and disease, as well as the burden of sin. And we seek to bring hope in Christ in these circumstances and in human hearts. We engage in doing good. We want to help people. And thank you for your generosity in supporting the ministries of mercy. Your gifts do make a difference in the lives of many people, men and women and boys and girls around the world. Today, we'll hear from uh, Doug Hoffman, the Executive Director of Mercy, Inc., and also Dr. James Kagamwa, the Director of the Bridge to Reading Ministry. As we begin, let me open with a short word of prayer. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to talk about things that matter, things that are changing the lives of people in different parts of the world and many nations. Thank you for your care in us and for us. Thank you for your sustaining power. Help us today to learn and to listen well and touch our minds and our hearts and blessings on this time. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, I'll be sharing about Bridge to Reading. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I'm going to share my screen now. So today we will uh, look at uh, Bridge to Reading and uh, the, the ministry uh, that we are involved in, in uh, mainly Africa, though we also have programs in, uh, in Colombia. And uh, I'll be telling you about the challenge of reading some of the interventions that we have put into place. And uh, I'll also share brief testimonies about those who are learning to read. I wonder uh, if you'd reflect with me very, very briefly and quickly about the first time you learned to read. Think of the time you realized that you could read. Um, I remember as a young man, probably as, as a small boy, probably in my second grade or so, just uh, realizing that uh, the syllables that were being written on the blackboard, if combined and sounded, actually made words which I could recognize. Who taught you to read? I know these experiences vary by culture. I know for many people in the West, you're probably thinking about your mother uh, reading those uh, bedtime stories to you. 
And uh, what do you remember the most about those moments? I remember also when I began to serve in literacy ministries, um, a young lady who had uh, come to our office wanting to be taught how to read. And I remember teaching her her first words. Uh, her very first word to read was actually mama. I wrote ma uh, in Swahili and told her to read it. Then I wrote another ma next to it and I told her to read. Then I asked her to read both ma's very quickly, just looking at her face. And uh, she read them initially very hesitantly, ma, 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 ma. Then she read mama, and it occurred to her that she could read for the very first time. And her eyes lit up with uh, excitement. Now, today in the world, uh, we are told that there's more than 780 million adults who cannot read or write in any language. And uh, more than 126 million youth are out of school, bringing us close to 1 billion youth and adults who cannot read in any language. And the uh, United Nations says that these numbers weigh heavily on global efforts to alleviate poverty. And as Steve mentioned, uh, literacy is an important tool for development, uh, for achieving uh, basic health, basic education, and even civil rights. And um, above all, for these people who cannot read, the Bible continues to be a closed book to them. And uh, Bridge to Reading seeks to open the Bible to these individuals who cannot read in any language. Being unable to read also poses a challenge to the local church in terms of discipleship. We read in Acts 17 verse 11 that the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And this is a dilemma for many churches around the world where memberships uh, cannot read. Members are unable to read, so they cannot search scriptures for themselves. And so discipleship becomes very, very challenging. <clears throat> what are some of our goals as Bridge to Reading? We seek to assist churches to develop effective literacy ministries. We'd like to see many people learn to read in their heart language. And we encourage tutors to share the gospel of Jesus with learners. Why do we talk about reading in the heart language? Learning to read is easiest in a language which someone can uh, already speak or a language that they understand. And that's usually their first language and it's their heart language. And uh, we seek to teach them to read in these languages because uh, in many cases, scriptures are already available and translated. So what do we do? We develop literacy materials, and then we train volunteer tutors, and also provide teaching and learning resources to churches so that they are able to, uh, to provide effective literacy programs. So how do we develop these materials? We work with Bible translators uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, we spend sometimes two weeks with a team of writers to develop uh, 70 to 90 lessons, easy easy lessons, simplified Bible stories. And in uh, the case of our literacy manuals, we engage translators who understand the different languages to translate them. And in this picture, uh, that's me leading a team uh, in writing primers. And then we were testing uh, the first lesson in this language in West Africa called EPA. So 
So as I said, we work with churches to train volunteer tutors. In this case, we have uh, the church recruit their own volunteers to be trained to read. We basically ask that they identify uh, fat Christians, faithful, available, and teachable. And they should also be able to read in the local language. And then Bridge to Reading will conduct a, a week-long training, sometimes four days, at a local church at the invitation of the pastor. And once we've trained the tutors, the tutors will go ahead and teach five to 15 learners at least two to three times a week. One of the questions we get often is, uh, how long does it take uh, these uh, new readers to master the skill of reading and writing? And uh, the question, the answer usually is that it varies. Um, the more often they meet in a week, the quicker they get through the curriculum. But it could take uh, as little as four months, uh, sometimes as long as nine months to master the basics of reading and writing and to be able to read fluently in a native language. And that picture is taken from a class that I visited in, uh, in Northern Togo. Together with me to the right is uh, uh, the VCP director, Claude, and uh, the literacy teacher for that class. As we work with these communities, we engage local pastors and uh, village leaders. Um, we are keen to ensure that they embrace the program as their own, that we just come alongside as partners. And so we take time to explain to them uh, what, what it will take to run an effective literacy program. And uh, we explain to them the criteria for determining who gets trained as a tutor, and uh, who gets trained as a trainer as well. In this picture, I'm uh, meeting with uh, uh, local pastors and elders in a community in West Africa. And on the bottom right uh, uh, was a meeting that I had with the local chief of the village. And um, he said he was not a believer in Christ, but uh, readily welcomed as to conduct uh, the program, which we hope to launch uh, more fully in that part of Africa. As I mentioned, the tutor training workshops usually take um, uh, three, four, sometimes five days. We bring leaders uh, into a central location, usually a training center and um, we spent time just uh, inducting them on how to teach reading, how to teach writing, how to share uh, the gospel with a, a non-reader and how to invite members of the community and organize them uh, as they come to a literacy program. We believe strongly in, uh, in expanding our program through multiplication so we train tutors, but we also train trainers. And so um, as soon as we've trained the tutors, we encourage them to go and teach at least 40 hours. And then uh, we vet a smaller group. And from that group, we get to train now the trainers who uh, go ahead and conduct multiple trainings in different locations thus upholding the words of Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2, where he says, and the things you had from me say in the presence of many witnesses. Um, and trust to reliable people who are 
also qualified to teach others. Besides the teaching of reading, we also um, teach uh, numeracy or simple arithmetic, um, beginning with counting, um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And uh, here is a, a bridge to reading tutor in Eastern uh, DRC, the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, um, uh, providing, uh, presenting a lesson on uh, uh, simple arithmetic to a group of learners. We know that um, non-readers uh, in any community um, are easily taken advantage of if uh, they are unable to count. They need to be able to count money. They need to be able to negotiate and bargain. And uh, they need to be able to, um, to determine um, the prices and cost of the different items that they may take to the market place to sell and uh, the different things they may go out and buy. That's a picture of a literacy class in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo in Central Africa. Um, the tutor is standing uh, to the right in a yellow t-shirt. Um, her name is Judith. And uh, you can see the learners. And uh, these classes uh, meet in uh, churches sometimes, sometimes in, uh, in, in homes, like this is a, a homestead. Um, and they rely on having a large chalkboard to be able to, um, to present the lessons. You may also notice that uh, this class is uh, predominantly uh, comprised of women. And uh, it's a basic reality of uh, illiteracy around the world. Uh, majority of the non-readers are actually women. In fact, two out of three non-readers are women. And uh, what we've seen is that uh, being able to read um, enables women to take better care of their children uh, as they are able to administer medication if they need to. They're able to um, take better care of their crops and, uh, and uh, they're able to just uh, in an overall way be more effective in their work. I'm going to share with you a short video of a literacy class in West Africa. So I'm gonna take you into a literacy classroom. Uh, you'll get to see the teaching of reading and writing being modeled. And so that's just one of many uh, literacy classes uh, that we have um, across the continent. Um, you may have observed that uh, there were some students there who had children um, and uh, they came with them to class. These classes are open to the community. Um, there's no uh, restriction, they're free. We encourage the, the, uh, the church to let members of the community know that if you want to learn to read, you're welcome to join uh, an existing class. And so 
um, these are open centers for um, teaching, reading, and also outreach to the local communities. We have lots of testimonies we could share with you about uh, those who've learned to read um, as adults. There's one that uh, um, highlights the, some of the challenges that uh, may not be easily recognizable that uh, non-readers face. A student in uh, the Central African Republic, CAR, uh, shared about um, how she really felt sad that she could not read and write and how she resented her mother for not paying her school fees when she needed to go to school. And she shared about how she would feel uh, resentful when she saw someone reading in church. And then she was welcomed into a literacy class which was started in her community, in her local church. And she started to read. Uh, and she said little by little, she felt happy. And uh, she also began to invite others to come into class and learn to read. Some of the learning resources include uh, the, uh, the slate that she has for, for writing. Um, we provide uh, teaching and learning supplies. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this now. Um, as Bridge to Reading, we are partnering with local churches and our goal is for them to provide effective um, instruction. And one of the things we have identified as a powerful tool for improving instruction is basically just the chalkboard. Um, in many classes that I've visited, uh, I've seen um, very, very small, tiny chalkboards, smaller than the one which uh, that uh, tutor is using on the top left of the screen. And we've realized that just by providing a chalkboard, um, which is kept in a church, um, we can improve teaching and learning uh, uh, tremendously. These chalkboards, once provided, um, are not just used for the literacy class. They're used for other um, purposes as well. Um, if the church is involved in a seminar, they get to enjoy the, um, the use of a large blackboard <clears throat> um, during such seminars. Or if they have uh, children learning uh, in a nursery school, uh, or a kindergarten sometimes, as some churches in Africa do, they have access to such a board. We also provide uh, tutor and trainer materials. And uh, I'd like to invite to, to introduce my colleague right there. <clears throat> the gentleman uh, right in the middle in a colored shirt, his name is Pastor Herman Mutuzi. He's based in Eastern Congo. And, um, is distributing to trainers uh, the Bridge to Reading uh, trainer guide and manual, and um, also primers in the Swahili language, which is used in that part of, uh, of East Africa, or Central Africa rather. Uh, Pastor Haman is a, a very effective trainer and he travels widely in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Burundi, and um, in, 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 in neighboring countries, conducting tutor training and uh, providing some of the resources and supervising uh, the work, as well as encouraging uh, tutors and learners. And uh, if we had time, we'd share more pictures of even him baptizing some of the uh, learners who've given their lives to Christ. Bridge to Reading is a powerful tool for evangelism uh, and um, it offers many opportunities for tutors to share the gospel of Christ. To date, we estimate we have at least 3,000 adults and teenagers learning to read in uh, local churches in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Central Africa, in Burundi, 
and also in Colombia. We seek to expand our work into other parts of the continent. As we prayerfully consider expansion, we are looking at uh, uh, Africa's, uh, we refer to this region as Africa's convergent zone. Um, the southern part of Africa uh, being uh, um, sub-Saharan Africa, having many Christians and Northern Africa, um, predominantly Muslim, but there's a zone where these two groups meet together with uh, animists, those who practice traditional religions. And um, we are encouraging our churches in these uh, areas to provide more literacy programs as a friendship outreach where anyone who wants to learn to read can walk into a church and be taught how to read. As I said, to date, we have work in the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Burundi, in the Central African Republic. And now we are launching out into Togo, Benin, and uh, uh, Ivory Coast. Last year, I was able to visit Ivory Coast and Guinea. And um, we are planning to launch uh, programs in these countries. Um, in the next uh, short while. We should have done that this year. Um, as a matter of fact, I was prepared to travel in the month of March, um, but uh, owing to the COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, we had to delay travels and we pray that uh, the Lord will keep these doors open for us. So as you look at the map of Africa, pray about our move to the West. We are so blessed to be a part of this ministry. We've seen many lives uh, touched and, um, and transformed. The Bible says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. There's a blessing in reading and this is the blessing we seek to offer. Uh, to different communities through your partnerships. We ask you to join us. Let's build uh, together a bridge to someone's literacy through our involvement. Um, thank you so much. Um, we'll continue. I'll take questions and uh, comments as we move on. This is Doug Hoffman. I'm the, the executive director for Mercy Inc. And we'll get to questions here in just a minute uh, as we do that. I wanted to just uh, thank James for a great presentation. Uh, he is a great partner with Mercy as Bridge to Reading is truly changing communities uh, one person at a time. But it does take, uh, and, and it truly is an economic change a personal change and a spiritual change as they go through that. But it does take resources to make that happen. And, and on the screen, uh, I'm sharing uh, the, the costs that it takes really to make that it work for us, both in Africa and in Colombia, where our primary work is being done. And you've seen those very crude, uh, what we would consider in the US at least, uh, crude blackboards, uh, but, they, but they cost us uh, some dollars, uh, and an average blackboard, for example, uh, is is fifty dollars. Uh, to so, but you can provide learning resources for eight students for a hundred dollars. Notebooks, primers, pencils, tutor guide. You can provide us uh, ten blackboards and other supplies that will help host fifteen students for five hundred. We can provide blackboards and student supplies. Uh, for 10 training centers for $1,000. Our goal today, quite honestly, is to raise $10,000 to be able to move into Western uh, Africa as, as James was indicating that he wasn't able to travel this year. But our goal is to be able to do that. And it will take us uh, about $10,000 to set up 10 training centers, 15 students, uh, 15 tutors and two trainers into that aspect. And we do pay a, a literacy coordinator for a year at $350 a month. 
So that is our goal overall. It, it, it is not an expensive program, but costs do mount up. So whatever you can uh, help us with, uh, we would appreciate that. You can go to our website, mercycompassion.org uh, and be able to give uh, online uh, to us or send us a check to Mercy Inc. PO Box uh, 20012 in Kaiser, Oregon 97307. Uh, so we appreciate that very much. And we're going to go to question and answers here right now. Travis, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Doug. Yeah, we've had several questions, James. Um, let's start out with a, a fairly easy one. Are the tutors and mentors believers? Yes. Um, thank you so much, Travis. Um, yes, the tutors and mentors uh, are believers we, because we are working through churches. Though we had a testimony of a tutor who said uh, she did, really didn't know Christ until she began to teach. And as she was teaching, she felt like uh, her um, engagement with um, reading, teaching reading, reading scriptures led her to make her own personal proclamation of Christ. Okay. Very good. Thank you, James. And to everybody, I do have a couple more questions that I'll ask, but if anybody else has questions, please go ahead and type those in the Q&A box at the, at the end. If we can't get them answered here, um, we will make sure an email answer goes out to everyone so that you can see the question. Uh, the next question we have, why do you work through churches instead of other groups as you teach people to read? That's a very good question. And um, it's actually a, an issue of logistics. We've identified uh, number one, in, in a sense, one, one aspect of it is logistics. We've identified uh, that uh, in many, many different communities, there is a local church. And uh, there's no better place to begin uh, the work than uh, in an existing uh, structure. So that's one of the reasons why we uh, choose to work directly with churches. Um, secondly, we, um, we have a goal of um, uh, empowering individuals to also be able to read scriptures for themselves. And so we, um, we've identified the church as a very viable partner. Although let me mention that uh, uh, being able to read uh, in a local language uh, enables individuals to access lots of other different materials and resources such as um, health and agriculture texts and um, uh, newspapers and uh, all other kinds of uh, materials. Thank you so much for that, James. Um, we will move on to the next one. Have you ever had problems in communities, um, in the communities that you're working where culturally they may not support women learning to read and write? Um, I haven't encountered this uh, problem uh, exactly. However, um, I have gone to communities where um, the men and women um, chose not to be in the same uh, classrooms where the women basically met um, as women and men as men. And there are many reasons for that. Um, some of the reasons uh, I could theorize here, I thought maybe men may, uh, in those communities which are very, very uh, uh, patriarchal, the men may feel a little embarrassed if they're in the same classroom with women and if women are performing better than them, um, which sometimes happens. So, uh, but I haven't been to a community where they said don't teach the women to read or write. Are they always are they always receptive to you teaching them teaching anyone to read and write? 
Yes, um, the communities are very, very receptive. Again, remember we are working uh, through an established structure, the local church. So there's always um, legitimacy in terms of um, already known pastors um, in, in that case, yeah. Um, is teaching English part of the curriculum as well? Uh, that's a very good question, Travis. Um, with Bridge to Reading, we do not teach English. And, um, and there's a reason to this because we, we visited many communities where people will um, request to be taught to read in English because they believe there's a higher um, economic value in being able to read and write in English. Um, however, from a standpoint of teaching and learning, we've, we've, we, 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 we know that people learn to read most quickly in their own native language. And uh, maybe in future, we may provide English language programs uh, through Bridge to Reading, but at the moment, um, the, the field is already so big with those who cannot read at all. So you look at teaching them to read and write in their own language as the as the first step. English may be a second step, but you have a large enough job to try and bring literacy to um, to people who can't read that you don't want to take another step and teach them English as well. That's right. Okay. Not at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So no, that makes a lot of sense. And just so you know, these aren't my questions, James. So you keep telling me that I'm asking good questions. It's all the, <laughs> all those, everybody who's on the, on the webinar that are asking these questions. So I just get the enjoyment of reading them to you. Um, one, just a couple other questions, but still feel free to ask more questions. We will continue to, to monitor those. Um, a uh, person asked that you mentioned that the classes are free. Would it be better to have a small charge so that they can be part of the, the class? The old adage is that you will get more out of it if they invest something in it. Have you guys ever thought about that? That's a very good question. Um, and, uh, and we've encountered uh, these kinds of challenges over the years. Um, in terms of uh, provision of uh, free resources. We, for instance, encourage the, uh, the, the local church and the, uh, the learners to provide or purchase at least the notebooks. Um, and where they cannot do it, we will supplement it. Uh, but with regard to instruction, we feel uh, that uh, the teaching of reading uh, and writing in a local church or by a local church uh, should be approached as a ministry of the church. Uh, just the way a church will provide Sunday school classes. We've encouraged uh, pastors to look at this as their uh, own local outreach and to open their doors to anyone who'd like to learn to read and write. And uh, the, the question is important because they, they're raising a very legitimate issue here. Um, how do we ensure that uh, those who are coming to read um, are also valuing the quality, the instruction that they're receiving? In that regard, um, we do, um, in some cases, just supplement the uh, provision of materials. Uh, but they still have to buy um, where they can afford it. And that's left to the determination of the local church, primers, notebooks, pencils, and that. But the instruction is, uh, is offered freely. So, so they don't have to, to pay per se, but what you're saying is that they do need to bring materials with, so they have um, s some skin in the game. They have they've actually had to pay something to get the, that notebook, um, which could be a very big deal in some of, the, some of the villages that you're teaching. 
yes, even then, um, it's a very, very minimal payment. And uh, we watch out closely to see that uh, teaching and learning is not hindered for anyone who can't afford a notebook. Yeah. yeah. Okay, the last question, unless somebody sneaks one in while we're while you're answering this, um, do you have a prayer group that that um, this person could be added to in order to pray for the expansion into the convergence belt or the tension belt? Um, at the moment, um, we have uh, as different members of Massey Inc. and Bridge to Reading, we have individual prayer uh, support teams and um, but we will be constituting and we should constitute a broader prayer group for um, for the work especially into the uh, the new regions so if they want to be added to a prayer group we can certainly add them to a to a mailing list where they'll receive updates and um, prayer requests and would the best way to to get that information either email you at jkagamwa at mercycompassion.org um, or they could go to our website and fill out a contact um, contact form there and they would be added added that as well yes okay that sounds good so i think that is the end of the questions um, James, I want to thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to speak and to tell us and to let us know more about what's happening around the world with Bridge to Reading. Um, for those of you who, who are out there, this will bring us to our close. I will pray in just a minute and then we will be done. Um, but as Doug did say, you know, our goal today is to raise $10,000. And so uh, writing a check, um, going to the website, um, or I sent out a thing where you can text to give. Um, so there are ways that we can give. So we just pray that God would prompt you and that you would listen to how he's prompting to give so that more people around the world will, will be able to read and write, but also will come to know Jesus through this whole process. So let's pray and then we'll be dismissed. Our Father God, we just thank you for this great day, and we just thank you for James and the work he's doing. We thank you for his heart and his passion and um, all that, with all that he's doing. And Lord, we pray for all the tutors and the trainers and everyone that's still working around the world to help bring people to know or help bring people to learn to read and write. And we just pray that they'll continue to be able to work even through this pandemic. And we pray that James would be able to travel soon so that he can go and train more people so that this ministry can expand. And Lord, we just pray that you would bless each one of us today. And we just pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Thanks everybody for attending. We, we appreciate it. Um, be on the lookout for new, for the one for next month. Um, we are still looking to have these about once a month. So thank you so much. And we'll talk to you later. Goodbye.